In this section, we will be discussing how to write thesis statements and how to make an outline. A key part of being a historian is being able to pose a historical question and answering it with a thesis supported by historical evidence. Right? So you, um, and typically what happens is, is a historian runs across a problem and then changes that problem into a question and then tries to answer that question by looking at historical evidence. And this is what we do. And in, in a sense, it's kind of simple, and I think it helps us to understand better what we do and how to do it when we formulate this way, right? You have a question, you're going to answer it, and that's your thesis is your answer. How are you going to answer it? By giving people historical evidence to convince them that your answer is correct. So, um, now this isn't easy to do, but I think if we think about this way, it makes it a bit easier. Key to doing this, though, is thinking deeply and critically, and this is hard. It's kind of interesting. We live in a culture that glorifies independent thinking and says critical thinking is great, and we don't want to do it. And it's because thinking is hard. It is hard to think. It is mentally exhausting to think and to try and think deeply. And it's especially difficult because we live in, um, in a very, very capitalist society. And I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way, but it, it, we live in a society where time means money. And so naturally people, especially if they don't, you know, you want to maximize the value of your time. Um, and so you try and do, you know, we try and do things as quickly, as efficiently as possible. And in many ways, it's good to do things quickly and efficiently. But the problem is, it's really hard to think efficiently. It's really hard to think quickly. It takes time to think. And part of this class, um, and I think any kind of history class, is this challenge of making time to think deeply. And uh, I remember, to give you an example of this, when I was uh, working on my dissertation, I would often take walks and I would have a notepad. And it seemed crazy that I would do this to my wife, but I had to do that because when I was walking, I was thinking. And sometimes ideas would come to me and I had to write them down. And sometimes you'll just have ideas come at crazy times, but sometimes it just helps to have to sit and think. And this is good. Um, you know, I oftentimes, I pick up my children from school and I'm often stuck in the car line. And I notice that sometimes the car line doesn't move quickly because someone will be texting and won't notice that the car in front of them um, has, has already started. And I won't check my phone in the, the car because I actually try and use that time to think. I don't recommend thinking while you're, you're very deeply while you're driving. You need to concentrate on driving. But when you're waiting in line or just sitting, try and avoid the temptation to pull out your phone or to, to, do, to do something. Try and think. And think about what you're studying, think about your research. And if you do that, you'll find sometimes that just thinking about something for even just a few minutes, you'll have a breakthrough. And this will help you to write. But it's important when you, you think about your question, you think about your thesis, to think so deeply. It's hard to do. It, in a sense, it won't even feel like you're doing anything. But it's key to making sure that the rest of your paper goes well. If you don't have a clear question, you can't have a clear thesis. If you don't have a clear thesis, your paper is just a bunch of stuff. right? So you need to have that clear question. You need to have a clear thesis. And to get that, you have to think deeply. So in order for a question and a thesis to be a appropriate and suitable question or thesis, there are certain criteria that have to be met. First of all, your thesis has to be something that can be argued with. For example, the, uh, you can't, your thesis can't be there was a battle at Gettysburg in, during the American Civil War. Um, that's not something you can argue with. There was a battle at Gettysburg. On the other hand, arguing why the Union won the battle is something that would be appropriate. Arguing the importance of the battle in the war would be appropriate. Right? Why did the Union win the Battle of Gettysburg? That, that's an arguable question because you could say, well, you know, they had better artillery or they had more soldiers or something like that. Your question must be narrow enough that it can be answered in a paper. And this, is, I think, is a big challenge, is that people want to ask big questions. So, you know, how did a, um, what was the meaning of the Holocaust? Or how did the Holocaust affect Judaism? Or how did it affect Christianity? That's a huge question that would take many books and a lifetime of research to fully explore. It's better to narrow your thesis. And a way to do that is by focusing on a particular primary document or a particular person. 
So rather than how did the Holocaust affect um, Christianity, you would say, well, how did it affect a certain Christian thinker? And then you could look at that one person and you could even focus on just one book or one period of their life. So you have to find a question that is um, important and interesting to you, but then you also have to kind of make it narrow so that you can actually deal with it in a question or in a short paper. It, the question also must be answerable based on available evidence. Students ask great questions and are always coming with me. It's like, hey, could I do my paper on this? And I'm like, that's a great question. Do you know of any evidence that can be used to answer that question? And unfortunately, they don't have it or it's in a foreign language or something like that. So you just got to make sure that your question can be answerable based on available evidence. Your question and thesis must be clearly identifiable in your paper. If you cannot point to a question in the first paragraph, if you cannot point to an answer to that question, your thesis, in the first paragraph, you, it is not sufficiently clear. And sometimes people say, well, I don't want to write a traditional paper that has a thesis. It's like, no, you need to do that. Um, because usually when that happens, it's because the person just doesn't want to think about it and doesn't want to give an answer. But nope, got to give an answer. Got to have a clear question that you are answering. And finally, it must be stressed that if you don't have a clear question and thesis statement, your paper is just going to wander around. Um, it's not really going to have a clear point, And you'll, you'll, you'll end up wasting a lot of time um, doing things that you don't need to do. It, it's important that you invest the time to really think about your question and your thesis statement. In the long run, it will save you time. Now, I just mentioned the first paragraph, and I think the first paragraph is very hard to write. In fact, a lot of times, honestly, when you're actually writing your paper, I write the introduction last. Now, that being said, you still have to have a thesis and question when you start your paper. But like I said, writing the introduction to a paper can be very difficult. What makes things easier, I think, is following a formula. You can kind of think about it like this. You probably have watched in your lifetime a Scooby-Doo cartoon, right? Scooby-Doo cartoons always follow a formula. The um, Shaggy and Scooby and the gang, they go to a, uh, a new location, like an amusement park or a hotel or something. And there they learn that, oh, there's a haunting, there's a ghost. And they investigate. And they always, remember, they always split up, and they always split up in the same way, and they find clues, and they think they figure out that it's, it's really a person behind the crime. They set a trap. The trap always fails and backfires, but then somehow they always catch up, ca ca end up capturing the criminal anyway, and then they unmask it, and he always says, you know, the criminal's always upset and says, if it weren't for you meddling kids, right? And that's the formula, right? So when you watch a Scooby-Doo cartoon, you know what's going to happen. The reason that they have formulas for cartoons and TV shows is it makes it really easy to write them. Right, so you can think about that, right? With a Scooby-Doo episode, all you have to do to make an episode, think of a location, think of a reason why someone would, would maybe want to haunt that location to, to scare people away, come up with some clues, come up with a wacky trap and a way for it to backfire, and you're basically done. You know, it's, it's something you can do very quickly. Well, it, the same is also true of historical writing, and especially introductions. And a lot of what I'm going to try and do in this lecture, and especially on this slide, is talk to you about ways that you can use formula to make your presentations, your writing, easier. So, for example, you'll notice that a lot of ways, and I, I do this in my papers, is that I like to write, an, I like to start a paper with an anecdote or quote that raises a problem. So, for example, I wrote this paper called, like, Birds and Beasts. And I start off the paper with the story of a woman in 19th century Korea who is 60 years old, and she is taken out by the government and decapitated. She's executed, right? This 60-year-old woman. Now, that catches your attention, right? Um, I mean, it's kind of like, whoa, what's going on here, right? They, they just took out this old woman and killed her. And why did they kill her? Because she was a Catholic. And the question is, that raises a question, right? So I've introduced this anecdote that grabs your attention. Old woman gets her head cut off, right? And I'm, I'm not trying to, to make fun of it. Certainly not. I, I feel very bad for uh, poor Elizabeth O. But the key thing is that, that that grabs our attention. And that problem raises a question. Why would the government do this? Right? There's my historical question. Why was the government willing to execute people in this way that seem otherwise harmless? Why would you need to execute a 60-year-old woman? even if she is a Catholic, right? Why would you do this? So you have an anecdote that raises a problem. Uh, and you may remember with this all man, all priest article I've referred to, you know, my problem is, there, the anecdote I have is that there's a statue 
dedicated to this guy that says, all man, all priest. Well, why would you need to affirm that a priest is a man? And why would you focus on him being a man anyway? So that problem raises my question. So, and I use an anecdote that catches people's attention. And that makes it easy. And a lot of times it'll be just a quote from your primary sources. That's a way to catch your reader's attention. It makes it easier to start your paper because you start with this quote. You start with this story. The story raises a question. And then um, you just have your thesis answering the question. So I said in, in my paper about poor the, this poor Catholic who's executed, I said, this is because the government saw Catholics as dangerous just by their very own existence. Just the fact that they existed was bad. In fact, the government saw them as dangerous beasts that had to be killed. And then my paper is just giving that evidence. Um, in the case of the all-man, all-priest, I argue that there was a crisis of masculinity in this time period that led people to, to want to find fatherly figures who were protectors and who would defend them. And so they thought of Father Capon in that way. All right? So this can help you write your introduction. This can help you think about how to make your thesis. Right? Um, your thesis is answering this question. You get the question from this kind of anecdote, this kind of thing that attracts your attention. So just to repeat, just to make things clear, so here's, I, I want to kind of give you an outline um, for my paper, All Man, All Priest. And, I, and I, it's key when you write to be able to think in terms of an outline. If you can't outline your ideas, your paper is just going to be a bunch of stuff, right? It's just going to be a bunch of stuff. So um, if you don't have a clear question or thesis, your paper is just going to be a bunch of stuff. And that's something you really, really got to keep in mind. So the, um, like I had said, I used for my introduction to that article, I used this anecdote about the statue, right? The statue says all man and all priest. And then my question was, why was Father Capon remembered um, in such masculine terms? And my thesis, the answer was, this paper will argue that Cold War anxieties about masculinity led to ideals of men as fathers, that caused people to perceive Capon's efforts to live out his priesthood in uh, distinctly masculine ways. Right, that's my thesis. So fairly, fairly straightforward there. Now, one way you can think about kind of organizing your paper before you set up a proper outline is to think about it in parts. So usually the first part of your paper is just going to be background. You have to introduce us if you're uh, to the person that you're talking about. For example, if you're focusing on just one person, you need to tell us about that person. So in part, um, and you also need to tell us about the historical context. So usually your, your first part of your paper is just going to be giving us information about the historical context and the person. So in part one of my Father Capon paper, I gave background information about the time period with a focus on Catholicism and anxieties about masculinity in the Cold War. That was my first part. And I also talked a little bit about Father Capon as well. Um, in the second part, I also introduced evidence showing Capon's focus on spiritual concerns and efforts to fulfill his duties as a priest. I, I remember part of my argument is that Father Capon, um, even though he's remembered in a masculine way, he is not always, um, uh, he didn't necessarily think much about his own masculinity. He thought mostly about his duties as a priest uh, and didn't really connect the two in, in a really strong way. In part three, then, I looked at how POWs remembered him in a distinctly masculine way. Right? I, I looked at that was what I was interested in part three. So you can kind of see, right, I have background information. I deal with the first part of my argument um, showing how Capon, um, you know, he wasn't thinking in these necessarily in these masculine terms. In part three, I look at how the POWs remembered him in a masculine way. That supports my thesis, right? Because my thesis is about how he's remembered in masculine ways. And in part four, my focus is on how a television show in, um, presents Father Capon in a very manly way. And that kind of highlights, you know, again, that connects back to my thesis where I'm looking at how did this guy, how was he looked at in these different masculine ways, his kind of protector. And, and I go into more detail than what I just showed you in these parts, but this is kind of a useful way to think about it, right? So, you know, you've done some research. You don't want to necessarily just sit down and start writing per se, I mean, that, that may work for you. It's good to kind of sit back for a second and think about the different parts that would make up your paper. And of course, then I ended with a conclusion that showed the, the contrast between Father Capon's views and that of others um, about masculinity, how he didn't understand himself in this terribly masculine way, but other people did. And then I described why that's important. And my key point was it was important 
because this shows how even though you had this dominant idea and anxiety about masculinity, that didn't necessarily concern people who were more concerned with other things such as religion. So my argument, whereas Capon tend to understand things religiously, other people were more concerned with masculinity, so this crisis didn't necessarily affect everyone. It's important then to also talk about headings. Your headings should divide up your paper um, into clearly identifiable sections that will walk your reader through um, and help them understand your argument. And I've talked about this before, and I want to give you more concrete examples. But you'll note that papers that have headings, books that have headings, are easier to read. And they're better organized. And it's very clear. You can just tell from the heading what this person's going to be talking about. So I, if, I, if you look at my article in terms of headings, right, I just talked about in terms of parts. Well, I divide those parts into more headings. So I started with an introduction. I didn't actually have a heading introduction or an, a heading that said introduction. That was just the first part. But the introduction, that's where I raise my problem. I give you my question. I give you my thesis. Then I had a section, and this is the title of the section, The Cold War Crisis of Masculinity and Father M. L. Capon. And that's where I talked a little bit about the historical context and talked a little bit about M. L. Capon. But especially I talked about there were these fears, these concerns about masculinity. And I talked a little bit about how Capon was relatively unaffected by them. Then I had a section called The Young M. L. Capon, which is where I, I kind of developed those ideas about how he, while he himself was unaffected, by um, largely unaffected by this concern over masculinity, the way he is he was remembered as a child was colored by them. So when other people look back at him, uh, they made every effort to say he was normal. He was a normal boy, and that's kind of interesting because it shows their anxiety and fear that a priest is kind of abnormal because he's not he doesn't get married, he doesn't have kids. Um, so. They had this kind of, uh, this is where this anxiety touched upon people um, and caused them to remember him and to emphasize his masculinity because there was a fear that if they didn't, he would seem kind of weird. Then I talked about Father Capon in the Korean War, and that's where I talked about what he did during the Korean War and how he thought about it. You may remember in another lecture I gave you this letter um, where he talks about how scared he was and how it was really disturbing what he was seeing. And I include that in this section, but I also show then how POWs emphasize his bravery and his manliness and his work as a protective father. So I, that's why I do in that section. Then I have another section called The Good Thief, and that is devoted to that uh, the movie, the, or I'm sorry, the TV show about him that really emphasizes he was a manly man uh, and that's where I show that, again, you know, in real life, he was kind of a thin guy. He had kind of a nasally, um, high-pitched voice. But then when they, they had him played in this movie, they, he was played by a uh, former Marine, former college football player, James Whitmire, who was a very manly man, who had a very gruff voice, very strong guy, very different. Uh, I mean, Father Capon was strong. He was a farmer. But he was this lanky, thin guy. And they had basically a bulldog playing him. And I made a contrast there. Then I had a section called Remembering Father Capon, where I looked at how uh, different people who were not POWs remembered him. And I looked especially at episodes where he wasn't, the focus wasn't his manliness, the focus was something else. Uh, so, for example, um, the, the Koreans who remembered him tended to focus on issues of meaning, that he was someone who kept faith despite this very, uh, you know, this terrible war that killed so many Korean people, as well as Americans and, and uh, Chinese and UN forces. And in the conclusion, I, I brought these things together. I, ex I revisited my introduction and I kind of expanded. And as I said, you know, see, there's different ways that these guys are being remembered. And even though he was a religious figure, um, the, because of this crisis of masculinity, many people kind of ignored the religious aspect of him and focused instead on, his, on this kind of idea of him as a manly man. Um, and this kind of the spirituality that he tended to emphasize was suppressed. Uh, in favor of this. So I, I get this example that when he um, was uh, uh, taken off, when he basically he was, uh, he wasn't killed directly, but he was taken to a hospital and left to die when he was a prisoner of war. And he actually asked the forgiveness of his, his captors. He said, I'm sorry for anything that I've done to you. And that's t usually left out. And I think it's interesting um, his emphasis on uh, imitating the suffering of Jesus, his, uh, the fact he cried a lot um, as he was dying, not because he was in, uh, scared, but because he was so happy. 
um, because he was basically going through this kind of religious experience. All that stuff's kind of left out. Anything that showed how weak he was is uh, before he died, because he became very ill before he died, was left out. And I talk about how this is kind of suppressed in favor of this kind of masculine image of the guy, um, which helps to fuel this kind of um, Cold War... Uh, uh, and this antidote to Cold War fears uh, that me American men aren't tough enough, right? So that we got this tough guy that we can imitate. So that was kind of my paper, right? And those are some kind of, I think those are fairly complex ideas, but you can see how dividing it into different parts and then having these headings can kind of guide people through this. And it's important that you do this. It's important that you have an outline. It's important that you have headings because it makes it easier for your author, reader, to understand what you're saying. And if you can't do that, that means you don't understand what you're saying. And if you don't understand what you're saying, how can your readers understand what you're saying? Right? If you can't make an outline, if you can't make a clear thesis and a clear question, I mean, you just don't know what you're saying. And your readers can't be expected to know what they're saying. So you got to think about that. you got to think deeply about that. Now, each paragraph should have a clear point that supports the thesis. So here's a paragraph I used. Um, and it, start, it just reads, Capon's manliness was emphasized at the very beginning of The Good Thief. So this is looking at that, that TV, television show as he appears in the middle of a firefight. His first act is to cradle a dying African-American soldier and pray the Our Father over him, a scene that emphasizes his fatherly character. Uh, if I was going to rewrite that sentence, I would, would be more explicit and say, you know, he's praying the Our Father, and he's acting as a protective, nurturing person for this soldier. Similarly, rather than Capon negotiating a surrender with the Chinese forces, that's what actually happened when he was uh, captured. He, he, he was with a bunch of wounded soldiers, and he negotiated a surrender. Um, his unit is portrayed as being overwhelmed by enemy numbers. The episode then transitions to the camp and Comrade Sun's attempt to brainwash the American POWs by telling them that they have been betrayed by their governments and are really puppets in the hand of imperialistic warmongers who seek to maintain French and Dutch power in Vietnam and Indonesia, respectively. In response, Capon then asks a series of questions that shows it is actually the Soviet Union that is the true imperialist, confounding son, who in his frustration shouts, you're an obstructionist, you and your church. Thus, while pals tend to focus on Capon's defense of faith and opposition to the anti-religious criticism of communist officials, that's what actually happened. Um, uh, Capon, when the communists would, would criticize religion, Capon would defend it. In the TV show, his opposition, though, is remembered as emphasizing the importance of um, defending America, right? Um, the good thief instead emphasized the importance of the priest as a defender of America. So here, this is supporting my thesis, right? My paper is all about how Capon is remembered in this masculine way. Remember, my, my question is, why is he remembered this way? Um, and my argument is, it's, it's this attempt to make him this kind of manly man. And here you can see it, right? It's, it's very clear. Uh, it, this paragraph is all about this idea of remembering him as this manly guy. And I'm showing how this sometimes leads them to even kind of misunderstand what actually happened or to kind of change the memory. Um, so, for example, this scene of him cradling a dying African-American soldier, it's possible he did that kind of thing, but I don't know of any record of that happening. And I don't know of his record, I don't know of any document cases of him interacting with African-American soldiers. Um, it just doesn't show up. I think they just added that to, to try and have a progressive, uh, you know, understanding of race there. But they're kind of changing things, right? But in any case, this all connects to this idea of the Cold War and masculinity. So it actually has to do with my thesis. And I should stress that each sentence is helping to clarify that point, right? Remember, I had that um, at the very beginning. I make it clear that Capon's manliness is being emphasized in The Good Thief. And every sentence here is focusing on that issue, right? There's a clear topic kind of sentence, sentence at the beginning that says what this get, tells us what this paragraph is going to be about, and then I continue to to deal to keep to that subject, giving examples from this movie, The Good Thief. Right? I don't suddenly bring in something else. This paragraph is all about the Good Thief, and uh, has sentences all about manliness there. Now it's important also to have a clear transition from paragraph. So, you know, this is the bottom of that paragraph. Um, and there it says, thus, while POWs tended to focus on Capon's defense of faith in opposition to the anti-religious criticism of communist officials, the good thief instead emphasized the importance of the priest as a defender of America. Then I, though, in the next paragraph I say, that is not to say that religion was neglected. 
Immediately after the above scene, Capon is described as being punished for seeing to the spiritual needs of his fellow prisoners. Now this is what key, right? I have a transition. I'm talking about how this movie changes religion um, around, right? Where uh, in the remember, I just had this idea where they're remembering uh, the POWs remembered that he defended religion. They've kind of changed that. Now, um, in the, the TV show, where he's defending the United States. Now, the thing is, remember, one of our five C's is complexity. And this movie, this TV show, doesn't completely get rid of religion. It changes it. And so I have to show that. So that's why I have this transition. Because someone may think, logically, oh, that means they're getting rid of religion, right? Because here, instead of defending religion, he's defending America. And I have to say, and my transition is, but hey, they're not actually doing that. They're changing it. Right? They still keep the religion in there, but they're using it in a different way. And then that paragraph then talks about that. So you can see I've kind of naturally, I've tried to think from the viewer, from the perspective of the reader, and I've tried to make it so the paper will flow in such a way that, um, that the reader's kind of questions are anticipated and dealt with. So you've got to think about that, how you move from paragraph to paragraph. Now earlier I gave you a formula that you can use when you're writing an introduction. Thinking is difficult, and anytime we can simplify our thought process with a kind of formula, that makes our life a little easier. So, remember I just said how each sentence should support your point. Each paragraph has to support your thesis. That's easier said than done. But one way that you can do that is by using what I, this kind of two-step formula where you make a point and then you give evidence to support it. So, in this section from that paper, I was talking about how Father Capon, um, they had this kind of difficulty. Because a lot of times when they discussed and they described someone who was religious, that sometimes seemed kind of feminine. And so there was this concern that um, when they described him as a young boy as being pious, that that would make him seem kind of girly. Right? Pious boys, they say their prayers, they do what they're told, they're obedient. But yeah, is that really that manly? Right? There, there's that, this kind of crisis because they had this gender idea of uh, gendered idea of how boys and girls should act. And the problem was ideas of piety and the way pious boys should act in Catholicism sometimes could be understood to be somewhat feminine. And so I, um, I note here, this did not sit comfortably with Cold War masculinity. So what happened then is, um, I give this example, I said, so um, this is kind of a concern, right? So Father Tone, this guy who's collecting letters on Father Capon after he dies, he wants to emphasize that Father Capon was a manly man, um, that despite being faithful and despite being a priest, who of course would not be able to express his manhood by um, getting married and having children, uh, he still wants to emphasize he was still a man. So I had the sentence, Tone thus made sure to include other statements that emphasized that Capon was a normal boy, reflecting concerns about conformity to masculine ideals. So that's my point, right? Um, I'm trying to prove this, this argument that masculine, he's remembered in terms of this, of, uh, in masculine ways because of this, um, this Cold War anxiety. And this leads... Father Tone, when he talks about Capon, he's, he's collected all the letters of Capon and has published them, he, he wants to try and emphasize that he still is a, a, a boy, that he's still a man, right? So I, that's my point. Then I need to give evidence, though. So I said, for example, Tone included in his collection an interview with a nun who had talked Capon in which he emphasized that, or which she emphasized that he was a real boy, ever ready to tease and joke, an extremely clever mimic, imitating his teachers and classmates, ball inoffensively. So he's got to be kind of a joker, right? He's got to be kind of a boy, kind of mischievous, mischievous, but not in a bad way. And so you can see there, I used evidence to make a point. And this is very easy to do when you're writing a paper, right? You make a point, you say, this is, this is what it is, this is what happened. Then you quote someone or cite a piece of evidence supporting what you just said. So point evidence, point evidence, point evidence. That can make it a lot easier to write your paper. Now those examples I just gave you were from a paper I wrote. It's much longer than uh, the kind of paper that I'm asking you to write. So I want to give you some examples uh, that students have given me uh, and I, I produce while working with students in some of my classes. These are a little bit more kind of realistic in terms of what you're doing. 
And basically, I, I kind of follow this outline. I want them to give me an introduction, an anecdote slash quote, a question that the anecdote quote raises, a thesis, and then paragraphs that support. And you might section, if you're listening to this for $4.99, it's a paragraph you, you would say probably section that supports. Um, and you would just continue giving sections as long as you need. Then you would have a conclusion that restates your thesis in different words. So one example, um, I had a student who wanted to write about Abigail Williams. And Abigail Williams, if, you, if you're not familiar with the name, she was one of the main forces behind the Salem Witch Trials, which is fascinating because she was basically kind of a, um, a young girl. I mean, she wasn't like five or seven. She was kind of a tween slash teenager. Um, but she's one of the main people that was one of the first people who was believed to have been um, afflicted by witchcraft and who made some of the initial accusations. So you may be fascinating reading about how she behaved under witchcraft or, or how she behaved. So, for example, you might include as your anecdote um, an early historical source that describes how a minister visited her house and how visiting her, he found that she ran around the room uh, acting like she was flying, how she threw, um, she, she got into the fireplace and threw sticks that were on fire around, and then she jumped into the fireplace. And then you could say, such, your, your question could be, you know, what's going on here? What, why is she acting this way? And why is it that then she goes out and accuses people of being witches and why is it that people take this seriously? Now, there are several questions there. We would maybe, you know, we'd want to work on kind of focusing down on one question, but that's enough to get us started. And there's different ways you could start to answer these questions, right? If you're asking this question of, you know, why does she accuse people of being witches? Why is she acting in this strange way? And those are two kind of connected questions, which we could work on connecting uh, more clearly. But this is, like I said, this is just trying to get things started. And you could say, I mean, some people just say, well, she was just doing this on purpose. It was all an act to try and get revenge on people she didn't like. Or um, you may say, and this is kind of the student's perspective, she really did think she was um, bewitched. And uh, she made these accusations believing that sh she was bewitched. But in fact, she was just very deeply uh, conflicted person and a very confused person who was suffering. And that led her to make these accusations. So there's different ways you could approach this. So um, you could begin talking about counter evidence. You could begin um, looking at how some people believe she was manipulating events. And you could quote some secondary sources talking about how she was manipulating people and you know she was basically getting uh, revenge on people who had harmed her or her adopted family and so forth. Um, and then, though, you could note that Godbeer, Richard Godbeer, who wrote, a, who's an expert on Salem witch trials, has made this argument that she's confused. And you could then say, I think Godbeer is correct, and I'm going to look at um, the historical evidence and, and to see why I think uh, Godbeer is correct. And that's where, then in your second paragraph, you could cite this evidence noting strange behavior, right? Um, and then you could say, you know, Look, either she, she acted strangely. We know that. That's something that, that happened. And we could say it's witchcraft, but, you know, you would say, I don't think it's witchcraft. You would say she actually seems to be behaving like someone who is suffering psycho psychologically. And then you could look under, um, you know, you could look through the, the sources. You could look at her biography and determine areas where she was suffering, right? This, her, uh, she actually did suffer quite a bit. And it would not be unbelievable for her to behave in odd ways. So then in your supporting paragraph, you could uh, three, you could give some evidence of the mental strain she was enduring. And then show how Puritans tended to understand mental illness um, or stress in religious terms. And that they tended to personify these religious terms, uh, these things, as demonic. And then that's why she could become convinced, right? You had this young lady who was under incredible stress and then who, um, who felt that stress and, and knew that she was behaving strangely, wasn't sure why she was behaving strangely, but who lived in an environment where it was understood that when you have those kind of strange urges, those strange desires, that that must be the devil. And that convinced her then that she was the victim of witchcraft. So that's a possibility, right? Now, like I said, this is just a really rough outline. You would have to develop it further, but that's enough that you could really start to write a paper and you'd have to do further research and other things, but something's coming together there. So let me give you another example. I'm, I'm gonna give several examples. 
I had another student who was very interested in John F. Kennedy. And the problem she noticed was that before he ran for president, he tended to be very, very emphasize um, a strong connection, a strong relationship between church and state. Um, but then when he ran for president of the United States, he disavowed that connection. He tended to back away from that. And the question was, why did he change? And this is a very good question, I think. Um, and the student's thesis was that there were differing voter makeups. Um, when he was running for um, his previous offices, when he was a politician, he represent he was working within the, his state, um, and the state he was in was a very uh, heavily Catholic. But then when he vote, ran for president, he had to attract many Protestant voters who were distrustful of Catholics. And so he ha what happened was the, the voter makeup changed. So this is, this is a pretty simple, straightforward paper. And it's easy to begin, right? She could just bring uh, two quotes together, one from before he ran for president, one while he was running for president, to show their difference, right? So that could be your anecdote. Then her question would be, you know, we see a big difference in this quote. They changed. What accounts for his change? Thesis, it's because he was appealing to different voters. So in supporting paragraph one, you would look at JFK's career as a senator working in his state, then his speeches showing his strong Catholicism and his belief that he uh, that there should be a strong relationship between church and state. Um, and then in the paragraph two, you would look more at his presidential campaign and the speeches showing him back and weighing from that, right? That, that proves your point that there was a change. Then in the next paragraph, you would look at the voter makeup in his state versus the national elections. And if possible, you could find, you know, look at his advisors, look at his documents and see, especially if he has any private documents that you can now look at, if he said this, if he said, look, I got to change my message because I'm dealing with very different people. So, and then in paragraph four, you could look at pressures on Kennedy changing his position uh, based on anti-Catholic sources. You could look at the criticism he was facing. That would certainly support this argument because he did face a lot of criticism. And you can even look for more justifications for changing. Did he in private documents talk about this? Uh, there was a family priest who was very close to JFK and kind of helped him deal with these issues. See if that guy had any documents. So you can see again, there's still more work to do, but once you have an outline, it's really clear about what sort of work you do need to do. So all that being said, you know, it's important to read, it's important to do research, but you also need to think deeply about your uh, about your your topic, and you need to think about how you're going to organize it. And you need to always keep in mind that you're answering a question with a thesis that uses historical evidence. If you can keep that in mind, it this will be much easier. If you if you lose sight of that, you're going to do a lot of research and a lot of work that ultimately will not be fruitful. But if you keep in mind what you're supposed to be doing and focusing on that and thinking deeply about it, you'll find that your work will yield better results and you'll write a paper that you can be proud of.